Hey, what's going on guys? Uh, today I'm gonna break down Jack Leiter. This is a highly requested mechanical breakdown. I'm also gonna get into a little bit of his pitch profile, uh, what makes him special, uh, break down why his fastball is so good, and just give some other thoughts I have about him. Uh, I'm gonna keep this one a little bit more brief. Uh, at least that's the goal. Um, so with that being said, let's get into the video. Hope you guys enjoy. So some quick facts for those of you who've been living under a rock. Uh, Jack's a Vanderbilt sophomore. He's draft eligible. He's a right-handed pitcher, 6'1", 205. He's actually probably more like 5'11", 6 foot. Uh, he was drafted in the 20th round in high school in 2019. He's also the son of former MLB pitcher Al Leiter, who pitched 19 years in the big leagues and was on the Hall of Fame ballot in 2010. And Jack also had an uncle and cousin who both played in the MLB as well. Uh, MLB Cops, he's been compared to Roy Oswalt. Uh, because of that stature and the uh, kind of drop and drive esque delivery, uh, I think he looks a little bit like Carson Fulmer, uh, just another Vandy guy, similar stature, uh, similar kind of bulldog mentality on the mound. Uh, just for some stats uh, from this current year, uh, he's pretty much carving it up, just over a two ERA, striking out a ton of batters, uh, 30 hits in 70 innings, 126 batting average against. He threw a no hitter March 26th, and he's projected as a first half of the first round pick in 2021 MLB draft uh, scouting report review so he's got a ton of pitches at, at his disposal uh, fastball is definitely his best pitch though uh, it sits about 92 to 96 uh, he's gotten it as high as 99 uh, but it's one of those things where you know he isn't necessarily trying to throw as hard as he can every single pitch uh, when he wants to he can pretty much throw 95 97 at any point uh, but he also just kind of cruises uh, at times as well he's he's indicated on podcasts that he's a little bit more focused on movement and location most of the time and then he can kind of uh, reach back and get a little bit more velocity when he needs to um, 22 to 2400 rpm for his spin rate so again uh, somewhere can in kind of that average spin rate realm but again spin rate does not tell the whole story uh, his vertical break ranges between 18 and 20 inches from what I was able to find about eight inches of a horizontal break so pretty average from a horizontal break standpoint um, but very uh, very exceptional from a vertical break we'll talk about that more in a couple slides uh, release height extension and vertical approach angle some other metrics here that we'll dive into more in a couple minutes again by far his best pitch he goes to that pitch the most and really most college hitters just aren't able to keep up with that pitch we'll, we'll kind of dissect why that's such a special pitch uh, you know, even at the big league level, I expect that to be a plus pitch uh, when he does eventually, hopefully, get to that point. Uh, curveball, upper 70s curveball. He spins it pretty well. Pretty good movement profile on it as well. Uh, he does a good job tunneling that curveball with the fastball. Uh, so being able to throw that fastball mostly up in the zone and uh, get that curveball to come out of the same tunnel, uh, he's got a pretty effective, uh, pretty effective one-two punch there, in my opinion. Uh, one thing that I kind of noticed is that again, he doesn't throw it particularly hard it's not a slow curveball but it's also not a super firm curveball uh, one thing we see uh, when examining the most effective big league curveballs is that somewhere around 80 81 miles an hour and above does appear to be an inflection point for performance of curveballs um, so, you know, so if he could get that pitch to 81 plus 81 82 83 um, even if he sacrificed a little bit of the movement on that pitch uh, there's there's a good chance and the data suggests that that pitch would likely perform better uh, even better at the next level uh, than it is currently performing against again less disciplined college hitters so uh, that would be something to, to kind of keep an eye on uh, then again he's got a slider he's got a change up uh, we're not going to get into that too much change up is probably his uh, you know worst pitch or most uh, you know most work in progress pitch as he said and then he's kind of played around a little bit with a cutter in 2021 as well from what from what I could see so what makes his fastball so good? I, I wanna kind of make that part of the focus of this video um, because we see him just blowing, absolutely blowing fastballs by you know good division one college hitters, just no hitting South Carolina, uh, very impressive. And the ball just jumps out of his hand. So what exactly makes it so good? Let's break this question down. Like what exactly makes an elite fastball? Because there's a lot of different ways to have an elite fastball that I don't think people realize. So an elite fastball is three dimensional. And what I mean by that is that there's multiple outlier characteristics that contribute to making a fastball elite. If the fastball looks like everybody else's fastball, it's not an outlier, it's what hitters become used to seeing, and it no longer becomes a difficult pitch to hit. So if he threw 91 and 
you know, his fastball had average movement on it. It came from an average slot, an average release height, average extension. That suddenly becomes an average fastball. So how do you create an above average or an elite fastball? Well, you're able to be above average or elite in multiple characteristics. Those would be variables such as velocity, perceived velocity, vertical break, induced horizontal break, vertical approach angle, horizontal approach angle. Um, those are more objective things that we can now measure with TrackMan. But we can also look at things like subjective, uh, subjective metrics like deception, uh, something that you know isn't necessarily that easy to measure at this point, but another characteristic um, that again can make a fastball even better than it might look. So let's look at some examples here, and we'll talk about this more in a second. But Josh Hader, Corbin Burns, Craig Kimbrell, right? These guys have elite fastballs, but they don't have elite fastballs just because they throw hard. They actually don't throw the hardest in the big leagues. They throw well above average velocity, but what makes all of their fastballs special? In Josh Hader's case, he's combining multiple variables. He's got above average velocity. He's got above average vertical break. He's got well above average, actually top in the league for a non-submarine pitcher, vertical approach angle. And so he's got this three-dimensional fastball that is very unusual to hitters. Corbin Burns, how does he do it? Well, he's got plus velocity. He's got plus vertical break, and he's got a very different look with the horizontal movement. So he's got very, very low horizontal break or cut on his fastball as well. He's throwing that, that cutter that he's using as his fastball, you know, 95 plus miles an hour. And so that becomes an elite pitch. Again, you can call it a cutter. You can call it a, you know, he's cutting his fastball, whatever you want to call it. That becomes an outlier pitch. Craig Kimbrell, same thing as Josh Hader. He's combining the velocity, the vertical break, and the vertical approach angle. So having a three-dimensional fastball is really how you create an elite fastball, not just by having velocity, not just by having vertical break, not just by having any of these variables on their own, but by combining them all until you create that unicorn pitch. And again, you notice I didn't really mention spin rate. Um, at Tread, we're not necessarily huge fans of looking at spin rate in isolation. Right? I think it's kind of ridiculous that, for example, Stalker came out with a radar gun where it just tells you velocity and then spin rate. In isolation, that doesn't mean anything. And so it's kind of a useless addition, in my opinion, because what use is knowing spin rate if you don't actually know how that spin affected how the ball actually ended up moving? And so spin rate really isn't as correlated to a pitcher's movement profile as people think. It's one variable to look at, but really we're more interested in how that spin actually influences what the pitch does on its 60 foot, six inch, you know, uh, a journey to the plate. So let's compare Jack Leiter to two of the elite fastballs in the MLB. We already mentioned Craig Kimbrell, Josh Hader. You'll see here in a second why I think they're both, their fastballs at least are good comps. So what jumps out from this graphic? Well, first you'll see if you compare velocity, they've all got above average or plus velocity. Uh, Jack Leiter, Average around 94 here in college, but again, it's a little bit unfair of a comparison because he's a starter. He's shown that he can sit 95, 98, 95, 97 when he wants to. If he was a reliever, that's what he would be averaging. Uh, so velocity, they're pretty comparable across the board. Uh, horizontal break, none of them have a ton of horizontal movement. Vertical break, they've all got above average vertical break. Jack Leiter actually leads the charge here with the highest vertical break among all three of them. So his ball actually has more of that induced rising effect. Uh, it resists gravity better on its path to the plate. Spin rate, again, none of them jump off the board. None of them have a 2600 RPM spin rate, but that's not really what matters again. And so while their spin rates are all average, Josh Hader is actually well below average. Um, they're all still able to get that above average rising effect on the pitch. Release height, you'll notice they all have a very low release height. Kimbrell actually has the lowest release height. Uh, vertical approach angle, again, this we'll get into more in a second, but this is really what sets all of these guys apart and why I feel like they're all good comparisons for his fastball. Negative 3.6, that's an extremely high vertical approach angle that becomes kind of an outlier pitch because that pitch keeps its plane on the way to the plate so well, it becomes another way to create a rising effect. So not only is the ball actually resisting gravity better, it actually has more induced vertical break but it's also being thrown up in the zone from a very low position. And so it stays on plane better and it rises and it gives this double effect of just jumping and taking off out of the hand on the hitter. And again, they all kind of have average extension. But again, if you have that, those multiple characteristics that are above average, it can make that fastball an elite fastball.
So why is vertical approach angle a big deal? We, we already kind of highlighted this and said that in Jack Leiter's case, it's, it's a plus plus feature for him. Well, it's the steepness of the pitch trajectory, like we mentioned. It's highly associated with strikeout percentage as well. I've shared this in my Jacob deGrom breakdown uh, from Dana Coyne, but this is actually from 2019, I believe, and it's basically the, the league leaders in highest vertical approach angle and actually lowest vertical approach angle. These are your taller uh, sinker ballers who throw down in the zone, and so they have that really steep downhill plane that you know pitching coaches used to really, really be fans of. And these are pitchers who you'll notice some of them are submarine guys who have really low arm slots and a lot of them throw up in the zone. And so that ball has a much less steep trajectory and is able to miss barrels up in the zone much easier. And so it's highly associated with strikeout percentage. As you'll see, most of these guys have 30, 35% strikeout percentage. And again, the sinker ballers who throw down in the zone, these are more ground ball type pitchers. So the point is that with high vertical approach angle pitcher, they're able to create this rising effect in three different ways. Velocity, having a high velocity, that ball is going to jump just because it's thrown harder. Having a high vertical break, the ball is also going to have a rising effect. And then again, vertical approach angle, the ball is actually less steep on its trajectory to the plate and oftentimes thrown up in the zone. And so there's three different ways that that ball jumps on the hitter. In Jack Leiter's case, negative 3.6 degrees for a vertical approach angle ranks him at the top of 2021 MLB leaderboards for non-submarine pitchers, right alongside Craig Kimbrell, and sixth overall if you factor in submarine pitchers. So he would top he would top the league when it comes to this metric, which is one reason that his fastball is such an outlier pitch and why college hitters just can't seem to catch up to it. So how do we increase vertical approach angle? Is that something that you want to increase or that we should increase? Well, the first option is to just be short, uh, but that's not really an option for most of us uh, you know, to choose. It kind of is what it is, so that's not really an option. We're going to cross that off. Uh, the second is you can have a little bit of a longer stride or drop your center of mass as you get into release. Having a lower release height is associated with having a little bit of a longer stride. This is something that Jack Lair's talked about before. He's actually uh, considering shortening up his stride a little bit because he has a tendency, in his opinion, to overstride. But nonetheless, he gets very far down the mound, and so he's releasing from this lower release height. And so that paired with throwing up in the zone, again, that ball keeps its plane better. He throws it up in the zone very regularly. He's getting most of the strikeouts at the letters, and hitters, hitters are still chasing it because it's coming out of that low release height. And you can also drop your arm slot. He actually does all this without really dropping his arm slot. He's utilizing these first three factors. If he dropped his arm slot to something like a Kimbrel or, or a Josh Hader, Again, that, that number could, could be even higher. But what would typically happen is you're gonna see a lower vertical break if you drop the arm slot. So he's kind of marrying all these variables um, and he's, he's really figured out how to, how to kind of maximize uh, this give and take to be able to miss bats up in the zone. So this brings up you know, my final point, was, which is that being short really is a potential advantage if you're this type of pitcher. If you are a high vertical approach angle pitcher who has good velocity and attacks hitters up in the zone and you can miss bats that way, it actually becomes an advantage. If he gained six inches, suddenly this vertical approach angle metric is no longer as much of an outlier. Sure, maybe his extension to the plate and his perceived velocity might tick up a mile an hour. And so there's a little bit of a trade off there, but it actually is an area where being short could be a, a big potential advantage. And it's something that uh, Jack and Rob Friedman actually both talked about uh, on the podcast that they did together. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's actually break down Jack Leiter's pitching mechanics uh, because they do contribute to a large extent to his ability to throw hard. And obviously it's not the only factor. He's put on a lot of strength in college and there's a lot of other things going into it, but how he moves is very efficient. And I want to just highlight a couple of the things that really jumped out at me. So first off, Let's talk about his leg lift and his linear move. So Jack has a very efficient leg lift. Now what we look for with leg lift, it's not just lifting your leg, right? There's a lot more detail that goes into that. We're looking at what happens with the center of mass as the leg lifts. And it's really helpful to see from a side view versus just looking from a front or a back view. But when we talk about the drift, we're looking at what happens to the pelvis and the center of the body during that leg lift. And so what we wanna see is that the center of mass actually begins to shift forward during that leg lift. 
In Jack Leiter's case, he gets a very, very pronounced and effective drift. He gets that center of mass shifting forward. Again, it's only gonna be three to six inches, uh, but that still is a healthy amount of forward shift and drift. And so that actually gets the center of mass away from the rubber and allows him as he drops into his back leg to be able to create more of a lateral force vector. And that force propels his center of mass forwards to the target. This is why balance points really aren't that helpful for throwing hard is because your center of mass stays stuck over the back leg and stuck over the rubber too long. And so you can't create as lateral a force vector. That force going through the ground, through the back knee, through the shin, ends up being lost because it's going in a vertical direction versus being directed in more of a lateral fashion back towards second base. So this drift sets up a really good linear move. Uh, we also look for what does the pelvis do? Does that pelvis uh, tip uphill? Uh, in his case, no, he does a good job keeping it stacked as far as not tipping it uphill. Um, but the pelvic tuck is something that can be very helpful. So rather than tipping it uphill, he's actually tucking it posteriorly. He's getting a little bit of that kind of flexion um, and tucking his pelvis underneath him. During the leg lift, this is something that most of the hardest throwers that we've observed do. And a lot of them also have this coiling action. Jack has this, this coil of the hips over the back leg. And again, he's just setting the shoulders closed, setting the pelvis closed, and using that as kind of a cue to stay closed off as he rides forward towards the target. So again, this is a position that we see in the vast majority of high level throwers. He's stacked, his head is over the back heel. He's beginning to shift his weight forward. He's got the coil, he's got the pelvic tuck. And this is a very efficient position to uncoil, unload from. Um, so he's kind of, he's kind of coiled the springs here and he's getting ready to unload that into this drop into his linear move. So let's get into the linear move, the hinge. As he comes out of leg lift, as he comes out of leg lift, you can see that there's a relatively tension-free drop into his back leg. So he's not immediately in the glute in the hinge right here. He's actually, you can see right here, he's letting gravity drop him down from here to here. This is something Trevor Bauer has talked about before. And this is very much the feeling uh, that you get in terms of throwing 95 plus as you come out of the drift. It is much more of a floating drop into the back leg. And at some point the back leg hits and stabilizes you in that posture. This is where his back leg actually turns on. From here, tension free, floating forward, dropping, 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 back leg hits, stabilizes and stabilizes him in this posture. And so what is this posture? Well, what we look for here is, again, where's the pelvis, where's the head, where's the torso? And we wanna see that pelvis relatively even with the horizon or at most about 10 degrees uphill. So he's keeping relatively stacked with the pelvis. We're looking for a stable back leg position, not overly caved in with the back knee, the heel still connected with the ground and the head over the back hip. And so he's in this very strong, stable position that he can move forward from. So after that aggressive athletic drop, what you'll notice is that he has an internal rotation dominant back leg. And so uh, this is something where, if you haven't been following some of our stuff, basically just realize that pitchers have different hip anatomy that they're dealing with. Some pitchers have better hip internal rotation, some pitchers have better hip external rotation. And so that has a big influence on how a pitcher actually moves forward down the mountain, the, the position that his hip is going to be in. And so you'll hear, you know, hold a vertical shin or, you know, drive the knee down to the ground. You'll hear different cues that pitching coaches, you know, tell pitchers to use in terms of their lower half. But a lot of times a cue won't actually work that well for a certain pitcher because they just can't get into a position with how their hip actually works. And so you'll see that he really does have a little bit of this uh, early internal rotation on the back leg. Um, it's actually something that he had a lot more pronounced caving, uh, kind of a caving in of the back leg in high school. And in listening to his interview with Pinching Ninja, he mentioned that that was something he really has been working on trying to firm up as much as he can. But then again, because he's limited in external rotation, he's, he's very self-aware about that, that it's not going to look like someone like a Corey Kluber. And so let's listen in for a second and just see what he has to say and hear his explanation about this. I'm just curious, what are you thinking of on your lower half? So even last year, my back knee 
kind of caved in um, a little bit sooner than I would like. And kind of my my anatomy, the I think it's the external rotation of my hips kind of doesn't allow my, my knee to, to push back in, into the sit as well as other pitchers. But I do I do work on that. Um, not not allowing the back knee to cave in as as early as it as it did last year. So another interesting fact about internal rotation dominant lower halves is that it doesn't always have to appear like a caving in of the back leg, right? If you have the pelvis held relatively neutral, you can create internal rotation in two ways. You could have the femur internally rotate, and it can turn into this kind of caving of the back leg action, or you can keep the back leg relatively neutral and stable and you can have the pelvis create that internal rotation by coiling over the back leg. So Diego Castillo is a great example of a pitcher with internal rotation dominance. He, he uses that hip range of motion to his advantage when he moves down the mound, but he's doing it while keeping a stable back leg versus just caving the back leg early. And so I think that's an interesting distinction uh, to make. And it's something that Jack Leiter can kind of, kind of take is uh, you know, he doesn't have to cave in order to take advantage of that available range of motion he's got. He still can keep that back leg uh, relatively strong and stable underneath him and get that range from the pelvis instead. And then again, he's he's got really good direction. Uh, he's keeping stacked through his pelvis and torso, and he's got a stable back foot connection point. So just three other things that we look for in the drive. Um, you can see that as coming out of his leg lift, he's able to direct the linear move towards the target. Again, sometimes when guys uh, stride a little bit closed off target, it can work like a Jake Arrieta, but in general, in most cases, uh, it is helpful to improve a pitcher's direction linearly towards the target uh, during this linear move. Uh, the stack, again, he's keeping the head over the back hip and the pelvis is staying even with the horizon and that back foot connection. You can see that as he's moving forward, because this is stable, he's able to be, he's able to move through his pelvis and move through the middle because this back foot gives him that stable ground contact point. If this is wobbling over the place or he has a foot stability issue or an ankle mobility issue or a back leg strength issue or what, what have you, he's not gonna be able to confidently and aggressively drop into the backside and move forward like he does if he doesn't have that stable contact point. So the next thing is tempo and rhythm. Now, I think it's interesting first to use this comparison between Jack and his dad, Al, uh, just because I kind of find it amusing. And uh, there's a ton of comparisons that you can make between the two of them. And obviously Jack had, you know, Jack was probably most influenced by Al and, you know, Al could really give him a lot of tips in terms of his own motion, his own delivery. Um, but I think it kind of makes this, this point in terms of just how quick Jack's tempo is. If you look at Al versus Jack and you actually count the frames, uh, which is how we quantify tempo, uh, which we got that from Paul Nyman. You can basically count the frames from peak leg lift to ball release and use that to quantify just how fast a pitcher moves through his delivery, which is what tempo is. And so you'll find somewhere in the range of 19 to 24 frames, 20 to 25 frames. Um, so Jack is on the very quick end of that range at around 21 frames. So he's got a quick delivery. He gets really gets down the mound. And why that's important is that it gives a lot less time for any inefficiencies to happen. Particularly when it comes to the arm path, there's no time for the arm to kind of hook or wrap around the back of the body or get excessively long or have any lags or hitches uh, or not connect to what the lower half is doing. Guys with quicker tempos uh, tend to throw harder. And there are some exceptions, and those exceptions are typically when you have a guy who's extremely strong, he can compensate for, for a slow tempo. Or extremely tall, he can compensate with his levers for having a slow tempo. But again, a guy like Jack, he doesn't have size on his on his side. And so a quick tempo, again, it's not, it's not surprising that he's utilizing that uh, to create a lot of this mechanical efficiency that you see and be able to transfer energy through his body as efficiently as he does. Uh, he's got excellent rhythm as well. And Rhythm is different from tempo. Tempo is how fast you're able to, to move and accelerate through your delivery, whereas rhythm is how smooth and, and sequenced you're able to transmit that energy through your body. So you could have a slow tempo, you could be slow to the plate, but have really good rhythm and connect it all really well. Um, you could also have a fast tempo, but be super herky-jerky and not really have good rhythm and not really be able to connect the, what the arm's doing to what the lower half is doing. And so he's able to do both. He's got fast tempo, he's got really good rhythm, and 
One thing that I think may have helped him with this, not that he wasn't already smooth in high school, but it appears that he's added the old school windup since he got to Vandy, where he goes hands over the head. Uh, so particularly in, in this bullpen footage, again, you can just see how smooth, fluid, and connected the arms and the, the, the handbrake is to what his lower half is doing. And so anyone who's followed this channel for a while knows I'm a huge fan of the old school windup. It's something I never used to do growing up or in high school or even in college. But as soon as I, again, began to try that and incorporate that, that really was a huge unlock for me in terms of finally being able to sequence and sync what my lower half of my hips were doing with what my arm action was doing and getting it on, it on time and feeling like my entire delivery was one piece. For me, that's that was kind of like the bridge that connected what my arm action was doing to what my lower half was doing. So you'll see along with this old school windup aspect, he has this really athletic drop under the hinge like we've already talked about. But again, I think in him, it's just so easy to see because there's a distinct difference between the faces, between the drift, between the linear move or drop, and between the rotation. He's got such a distinct uh, st start to where that drop happens because he's so exaggerated with the drift and then so exaggerated with how deep he drops into the hinge. Um, so Chase Petty, Trevor Bauer, and other two guys that he kind of reminds me of uh, with how athletic he's able to move forward down the mound. And then just a couple other notes, a couple other things that kind of stood out to me watching his mechanics. Um, you know, one thing, uh, I wouldn't say it concerns me, but it's something that, you know, might represent a slight mechanical inefficiency is that he does open the trunk a little bit early. And again, this isn't necessarily to the point where it'd be concerning, but generally when you see guys who are able to throw this hard, they're able to do it with a little bit more range of motion than he's showing. So he's not really creating a ton of separation. And he is opening the front shoulder a little bit early. We actually take him to weight bearing front foot strike. Um, so again, you put him side by side with his dad, Al, you can see Al doesn't have that issue and Al is able to keep the torso closed. Uh, so again, just something that stood out to me that, uh, you know, we do know from research that early torso rotation can be a little bit of a risk factor when it comes to arm stress. So that might be something from a sequencing, a timing issue. If you can keep the, the shoulders closed about one frame longer than what he's able to show here, uh, just for any other pitchers watching, that's typically going to be a better position to apply force to, to the ball. You're going to be able to apply force over a longer arc of motion. You're going to get a better pre-stretch through the anterior oblique sling, through the front side. And it's just a more powerful and repeatable position to apply force to the baseball from. So I'm not saying he should change anything. He's having success. It doesn't seem like he's having any sort of arm trouble whatsoever. Um, but again, a little bit early with the torso rotation. If a random guy came to me and, and was that open, I would probably suggest that that's something he looks into a little bit further. Um, this can be something linked to uh, guys who get a little bit long with their strides. We already know he's aware that he can overstride at times. And when you overstride, there's a tendency to get a little bit pushy because overstriding can lead to flying open a hair. And when you fly open a hair, again, you can't rotate nearly as well. And so you begin to get a little bit linear and a little bit pushy. And so I'm not saying anything that he's probably not already aware of. I know he's already indicated he's his own worst critic and he's constantly looking for things that he can do to improve. Uh, but I know he's aware of this and I'm sure it's something he's already working on addressing. He's also a guy with a little bit of a shorter arm path. Now, it's interesting, uh, when you think about short versus long arm paths, um, it's kind of become this, you know, this polarizing debate in the pitching world a little bit, um, but it really doesn't have to be because the fundamental principles of an efficient arm path are really the same. How, how long the arm is in the back, which is your elbow flexion angle during the arm spiral, doesn't really dictate whether the arm path is efficient or not. It's much more about do you capture that energy from handbrake into the arm path or into the arm spiral effectively? Yes or no. Some guys, when you shorten their arm path, they're able to do that better. Are you able to be around 90, around 90 degrees of elbow flexion at landing? Yes or no. In his case, yes, he's got a short, short arm path. He captures the arm spiral very, very well. He's able to get that elbow to about 90 degrees at landing. He's able to get that elbow in line with the shoulders and keep it in plane as he rotates, which is going to maximize his ability to get that rotational energy to actually spiral out and around into the ball. And he's demonstrating full layback at his shoulder and at his scapula. And so he's doing all of this, all of the fundamental principles of an efficient arm action well. 
And so whether he had a longer arm path or a shorter arm path, I would be saying the same thing. I'd be saying that's an efficient path. So again, I don't necessarily look at the shortness or uh, how long an arm path is as much as the fundamentals. Do they capture that arm spiral? Are they plus or minus 10 degrees of 90 at landing? Are they in plane? And do they exhibit full layback at the shoulder? So I have no problem at all with his arm path, it being short, uh, simply because he follows those principles. And then another thing to, to point out is that most of the pitchers that, that I break down on this channel are guys that produce their velocity with efficient patterns, yes, but a lot of times they're using extreme range of motion to create that efficiency, right? Jacob deGrom, Chase Petty, uh, these are guys that have unreal hip shoulder separation and unreal scap retraction and horizontal abduction. They're getting in these super deep stretch positions. And so they're using range of motion to produce a lot of that efficiency. Jack Clayter really isn't getting into extreme ranges of motion anywhere in his body. And it's another reason I kind of compare him to a Carson Fulmer, who again, doesn't get into crazy separation like Dylan Cease or crazy scap retraction like Chase Petty. And so he's creating his velocity not from extreme range of motion, but much more from having that quick tempo, having really good rhythm, having an efficiency with which he's able to actually transfer the energy from segment to segment, um, just being very athletic. So range of motion can help, right? If he had the kind of flexibility and lever length of a Jacob deGrom or Rodas Chapman or Chase Petty, he might throw a few miles an hour harder. But the point is that as long as you hit minimum positions, as long as you hit a decent amount of hip shoulder separation, you can block the lead leg, the elbow gets in plane, the arms up on time, right? As long as you hit these minimum positions, if you're a great athlete, you can still express higher velocities. And so range of motion is just one additional piece of the puzzle. He doesn't necessarily have that as an outlier factor. He doesn't have levers as an outlier factor, but he has these other variables that we've discussed that help him have an outlier factor, specifically in regards to the actual ball flight metrics on his fastball, his pitch ability, his mental makeup, which we'll get into in a second. So a couple other things I like about Jack Leiter, just from watching some different interviews he's done, listening to his podcast with Pitching Ninja and watching some different highlights. He clearly has a very high baseball IQ. Obviously he gets part of that from his dad. He's a smart kid. He's a student of the game. I think that bodes really well for his future in the game. He's got a very high self-awareness of what he's doing. He's his own worst critic. He's constantly looking for how he can get better and he's not comparing himself to you know, people that are below him. He's looking upwards, he's looking at how can he get better and trying to learn from the best. He's got to focus on pitch ability, movement, command over velocity. Again, it doesn't mean that velocity isn't important. A lot of the athletes that we coach don't throw hard and they're trying to figure out how to improve velocity. He was lucky enough where he could kind of focus on just efficient mechanics his whole life. Uh, you know, He was coached by his dad, it's a great position to be in, but he really has been focusing on pitch ability pitch movement, testing different pitch grips, tinkering, trying, testing, um, you know, being really hard on himself when it comes to walking batters. And so again, that bodes really well because he's able to, to pair that with plus stuff. And so he is kind of the total package when it comes to not just being a thrower, but being a pitcher. And he also has a strong focus on mental prep. And again, a lot of this probably comes from his dad from, from what he said, but visualization, having routines, having a way to regain focus when the game starts to get away from you. These are tools that most 19, 20, 21 year old pitchers just aren't really that familiar with. And, and even if they have heard about them or read about them, they don't really put them into practice. And you can tell that he puts them into practice and that he's, he's really able to hone in on his focus and on his mental prep uh, when he's out there. And so I personally feel like this has as much to do with his on-field success as his mechanics, as his stuff is there's a lot of players I've played with who can throw 95 plus miles an hour, but they're not necessarily gonna be the same type of competitor or be able to refocus when something doesn't go their way or, or battle out of a situation. And so that really is a, a kind of key ingredient that I'm, I'm sure is a reason that scouts are so hungry to get this guy. Um, is because that's, that's really an X factor component is how well do you compete when you're actually on the mound and how well can you use that mental prep routine uh, to aid in your, in your ability to compete. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. We're all about helping pitchers dominate hitters here on this channel. All things pitching development, from mechanics to breakdowns, to nutrition, to strength training, to mobility. Uh, we try to cover it all here, and that's really our focus here at Tread Athletics. 
go ahead and like this video if you enjoyed the content. Go ahead and follow me at Tread Athletics on Twitter if you want to see more day-to-day -day content from me personally, or you can follow our main account at TreadHQ. And finally, guys, if you have questions about your own specific situation, your own career, your own mechanics, what have you, don't hesitate to reach out. Contact at TreadAthletics.com. We read every single email. We respond to every email. And if you want to go ahead and hop on a call with one of our coaches to discuss uh, you know, personally what you're struggling with, um, don't hesitate at all. We're here and we work with hundreds of athletes around the country just like you. Thanks again. I'll see you guys in the next video.